Hello and welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast Seminar. I'm Dr. Saifuddin Ammous, and today we are joined by two guests, uh, Stefan Kinsella and Jed Grant. Stefan, uh, some of you or all of you hopefully should be familiar with him. He is the Stefan Kinsella, as uh, he often reminds people. And he was in, uh, he, he came and gave one of the uh, lectures in uh, Economics 12 in the course that I teach on this website, safetydean.com. So all of you who are registered can go and uh, see the discussion seminar that we held with him in Economics 12, where we discussed intellectual property. And Stefan, although he is a lawyer, which should uh, uh, genetically disqualify him from understanding economics, he has actually contributed some uh, incredibly important uh, economic uh, work and in, in the Austrian tradition. In particular, I think uh, the, the really most important contribution, uh, at least in my mind, I mean, he may disagree because he has many, but in my mind, I think, you know, he was the one who really laid out the Austrian uh, libertarian case against intellectual property. And this is something that, um, and th that there is some controversy among uh, libertarians about this and about whether it's a good idea or not that we have intellectual property. But Stefan, in my mind, um, settles this debate and explains very clearly why there can be no such thing as intellectual property, that property is only in things that are scarce and uh, rival. And uh, this, I think, is, 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 a, is, is a very powerful uh, analytical tool with which to analyze and understand the world. So I'm delighted to have uh, Stefan. And Jed is the CEO of KYC3 and also uh, the founder of the Open Crypto Alliance, and um, the, uh, which is an organization that uh, tries to protect people in the Bitcoin uh, space and, well, the crypto space in general from uh, patent trolls and from um, um, being targeted by uh, all kinds of nefarious uh, intellectual property uh, attacks, essentially. So we are going to be discussing today um, the, the, the case against intellectual property. We're gonna recap a little bit of, uh, from what uh, Stefan's uh, told us already in Economics 12. And then we want to look at this question in the context of Bitcoin and in the context of um, blockchains and in the context of open source software and where the threats are and what the problems are and. Uh, what people should be careful about. So thank you very much, Stefan and Jet, for joining us. Great to be here. So I wanted to begin with you, Stefan. I'm, I'm hoping you could just give us a, a brief overview of your case against intellectual property. Why is intellectual property not a thing? Okay, very briefly. Um, there's many ways to explain this. I, I found over the years, um, I think maybe the simplest is just to say that if you understand the kind of basic case for the necessity for prop property rights, right, um, then it, it, it's pretty easy to explain why intellectual property law is incompatible with that. So the basic idea is that we are human beings who live in a physical world, and we need to move around and use things to survive and to get things done, right? That's human action. So we basically employ scarce resources or scarce means, as Mises, um, Ludwig von Mises, the Austrian economist, calls them. Um, but because the, of the nature of these things, they're scarce in not in the sense that not being plentiful, but in being the type of thing that only one person can use at a time. They're basically um, they're basically rivalrous in economic terms. So they, that means there could be rivalry or conflict over them. Which means that you know if I'm using it, it prevents you from using it or it excludes your use, excludes your use. So only only I can use this piece of land to to plant a crop or to build a house, and uh, or only I can ride my bicycle, etc. If someone takes my bicycle, then I don't have it anymore. So people that prefer peace and pros peace and cooperation tend to prefer property rules that that settle the issue of who owns a given resource so that everyone can use them peacefully and without interference, and then we can trade and cooperate and, um, and um, you know, they all do better off, you know, have more prosperity in society. So that's the basic purpose of property rights, and the Western and the 
basically all of private law and all of humanity has roughly said whoever gets a resource first has a better claim to it uh, or someone who gets it by contract from another person. So that's the basic rules of property is that when there's a resource that two people dispute, we settle the issue of who owns it by asking who started using it first when it was unowned and who got it by contract from a previous owner. And those two questions basically can settle almost every property dispute in the world. Uh, now, in the case of your body, you own your body because you're the original inhabitant of it. Um, but for other things, it's who got it first and who got it by contract. Now, intellectual property basically is a grant by the government that says whoever obtains this government property, this intellectual property right, like a patent or a copyright, is able to go to a court and get state force used against a competitor in the in the market that forces them from using their own property as they see fit. So if you have a copyright, you can literally stop someone from using their own printing press or their own computer in the case that we were discussing earlier where someone is saying they own a certain uh, Bitcoin-related paper, and they're demanding that other people take it down from their servers. So these people own their servers. They own their computers, and so they own the memory on those, which hosts a copy of this paper. Um, so the copyright, if enforced here, would allow the owner of the copyright to basically control other people's use of their own property. So it's in a sense a taking of property, and it also results in censorship and distortion of culture. And in the case of patents, if you get a patent on an invention, what that means is you have a right to prevent anyone else from using their own body and their own factory uh, and their own materials to make a certain machine right, designed in a certain way. So it, again, it gives the patent holder a property right in other people's property. But those in, – in the law, I think it should be classified as what we call a negative servitude in the civil law or a negative easement, and a negative easement… Or a negative servitude is perfectly legitimate if it's granted contractually. This is the basis of 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 of, um, of uh, restrictive covenants in in home in neighborhoods where everyone agrees when they move into a neighborhood, you know, not to use their house for commercial purposes or something like that. So they give everyone else a negative right over their own property, like a veto over how they can use it. So their neighbors don't have the right to use their house, but they have a they have a negative servitude saying that you – they can prevent you from using your house in a certain way, but it's okay because you agreed to it. But in the case of patent and copyright, it's just a decree by the state that grants the negative servitude uh, on behalf of the patent or copyright holder over someone else's property. So it's a type of taking of property, and in the case of patents, this results in reduced innovation and in, in uh, monopoly prices and… Um, heavily distorts and sl uh, impedes the the, uh, the development of uh, of new techniques because once someone has a, a few patents on a given technology, they can rest on their laurels and just rake in the monopoly profits. And other other would be competitors are afraid to compete or to develop alternatives or improvements because they can't sell them for 17 years. So it delays the entrance of competitors and new innovation. So the basic case against patent and copyright is that they are anti-free market, anti-property rights, anti-competitive. They are state-granted monopoly privileges, right, which result in uh, monopoly prices and reduced output and reduced innovation and uh, in impediments to free speech. That's the basic case against patent and copyright. I hope you heard me. <laughs> Hello? If you're not going to jump in, say that ties into why the OCA Open Crypto Alliance exists. Um, the whole point is to keep innovation open and uh, keep everything available for those that are innovating on this technology. So that is that argument that we just heard is one of the core reasons why we, we set up Open Crypto Alliance. And I, I could add some, one thing too. So you'll notice that um, in the case we were discussing earlier, um, 
So patent and copyright are the two uh, core and historical and um, and most dangerous forms of intellectual property. The others would be trademark law, which you, uh, and trade secret law. Now you've seen a bit of the trade trademark law come to play in the Bitcoin sphere with uh, you know just the battles over the name Bitcoin. I don't know if there's been any official trademarks over BTC or Bitcoin itself, um, but that kind of dispute has to do with trademark. Now there's another type of of legal right in what in, in in the world in positive law of the world called defamation, which which is libel and slander law. Libel is the written form of defamation, and slander is the oral form of defamation. And defamation law is considered just to be a tort, where you're liable for damages if you if you misrepresent someone's reputation in a way that harms them. And according to libertarians, and and this is my belief, defamation law is Completely illegitimate as well, as Murray Rothbard explains in his chapter in Ethics of Liberty called Knowledge uh, True and False. Um, but the point I want to make here is that defamation law is – I believe should be classified as a type of intellectual property law because it's very similar to trademark law. They're both basically based upon the idea that you can own something that's not tangible, which is your rep your reputation, and just like with the case of patent and copyright. The flaw of all these types of laws is that they're, the law tries to assign property rights in non-scarce, non-material things, but that's literally impossible. It's not just that I disagree with owning information or patterns of information. It's not just that I don't like it or think it's unethical or unjust or immoral. It's literally impossible. It's not possible to own information because owning – is a physical activity backed by physical force of a law, and that can only be applied against things that to which force can be applied, which are physical things in the world. So all human rights – all rights are human rights. Only humans have rights, and all human rights are property rights, as Rothbard explained, because rights only apply to the physical things that we manipulate in the world, the means. And therefore, when you have a law that just says um, – um, uh, people have a right to their inventions, for example, or their reputations. They don't really have that right. That's a disguised way of transferring property rights in tangible things, which is why I think that – this is why I brought up the negative servitude idea earlier. Really, that's what these rights are. They're negative servitudes, and the, in the extreme case, they're basically slavery because if you can prevent someone from using certain words out of their mouth by, by like saying that you're – a bad person, which would be defamation, maybe, or by or by singing a song that's copyrighted, right? Then they have control over your over your body, which means they're your partial slave. So in the extreme case, intellectual property is a type of slavery. So it's about the worst type of law that we have. But so my point is, all three of these things are being used in the Bitcoin space. The defamation is being threatened against some people who claim certain people are not Satoshi. And um, uh, uh, patent in the case of uh, blockchain-related innovations is, is being threatened against certain uh, crypto companies who are you know, using – Stefan, I think you got muted. We can't hear you anymore. We lost the audio, yeah. Stefan, we lost the audio. Stefan? Now he's muted. Got to unmute him if you can do that. Uh, we lost you there in the last couple of uh, minutes, Stefan. I don't know if you can hear me, but we couldn't hear you. But I guess, yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the, 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 um, the crux of the point that Stefan makes, which I find extremely compelling, is that if you try to establish property rights over things that are immaterial, that are not scarce, that are not physical, for which there is no scarcity, there's no uh, competitiveness, there's no rivalry. You know, a bicycle, if you're riding a bicycle, I can't ride a bicycle. But if you're, um, if you're making a wheel, I can still make a wheel myself. So if you try and establish, uh, if you try and establish a, uh, if you try and establish property rights over a wheel, 
over an idea, over the idea of the wheel, then you're going to just end up, the only way that you can do that is that you're going to have to establish physical um, subordination uh, of the people that you're trying to uh, apply this on. In other words, you have to essentially declare uh, ownership of people's minds. You know, you can't think about the wheel that I invented and then do it. And so even, uh, and you know, even if you're building a wheel with your own material, even if you're uh, making your wheel with your own uh, material that you own, uh, if, if we were to say that this is, if we were to establish uh, property rights on the idea of the wheel, the only way that we can do that is by allowing some coercive authority to establish physical uh, dominance over the people that are copying the idea of the wheel. So you have to, you have to aggress against the property of peaceful people in order to establish uh, intellectual property rights. And so I think the moral case for it and the, the natural right case for it is, uh, is 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 completely invalid because there's there's no logical way in which you can start saying in, in which you can establish ownership and ideas and then you go around enforcing it by using effectively violence to stop people from using ideas when using ideas is completely peaceful so either we live in a world in which everybody gets to claim an idea and then we have an endless world of conflict where uh, you know uh, people want to control each other's things you know, you no, 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 you can't use your guitar to play my song. You can't uh, use your material to build a wheel that I had thought about before you. Um, you can't, uh, you know, you, you can't uh, copy an idea that I have. You can, all of these things. If we do it, then that means that we need, we legitimate uh, somebody um, using your physical material. Uh, we legitimate the sovereignty of others over your own property and your own body. And that's, that, that's I think, the uh, kind of natural right um, take on it. And of course, uh, there's a less popular way of understanding it among Austrians is to think about it in terms of its effects, in terms of uh, the economic consequences of it. And so for some people, they would say, well, maybe it's a bit messy, but at least if we establish intellectual property rights, that will give us more um, innovation and that'll allow the world to be more innovative because people would have an incentive to come up with uh, great ideas. And um, if, if, if they know that they can have property in them. But uh, Stefan also shows in his work that there's very little evidence to suggest this is the case. In fact, the opposite seems to be true. In fact, it seems that in industries where patents and intellectual property uh, gets imposed, you end up instead of have instead of motivating uh, innovation, you end up actually motivating litigation. You end up motivating uh, people to just uh, come after each other and to continue to fight over each other's property and how each other's uh, and, and how they all use each other's property. And I think this is the um, this is this is uh, the kind of utilitarian case. Um, and, and I think the utilitarian case against intellectual property is also quite uh, valid. Um, Stefan, um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, does intellectual property actually in, in, encourage innovation? Uh, you're muted, Stefan. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good now. Sorry. Um, yeah. I just posted a couple of links in the chat. Um, did, did my whole previous spiel get lost? Uh, just the last uh, few seconds. Okay, yeah, I was just explaining the defamation law, trademark and copyright and patent are all becoming threats to the Bitcoin ecosystem, um, which are all types of IP. Um, so the empirical argument is flawed from the start because it's utilitarian and it suffers from all the problems of, of economic utilitarianism. So, which is that you can't measure utility in cardinal terms and you can't compare it interpersonally. Um, and not only that, the evidence is just not on their side. In fact, so you could take the modern copyright and patent system as start, starting roughly in the around nineteen uh, around seventeen ninety with the with the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. system, uh, and it was wasn't based upon empirical evidence. It was just based upon sort of a hunch. You know, in the Constitution, it said to promote the progress of the science and the useful arts, which is which is um, 
authorship of creative ideas, which is copyright and inventions. It's just said to promote them, Congress can grant limited monopolies, basically. But it didn't prove that this actually did promote it. And in the 200 plus years since, no one has been able to prove it. You know, a lot of uh, empirical uh, studies have been done starting around 60, 70 years ago, starting really with Fritz Macklup, who was kind of a, I believe, a quasi-Austrian economist, um, and Edith Penrose in the 50s in the U.S. I think Congress commissioned this big study. And they basically concluded, you know, we cannot find any evidence that patents, for example, patents encourage innovation at all, because it has lots of obvious um, negative effects on innovation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, number one is that there's the cost of it, just hiring patent attorneys and having to hire lawyers to defend you in lawsuits and having to maintain the patents that you acquire. And, and it also distorts or, or skews research. Like if you can get a patent on this type of thing, but not on this type of thing, you might research in that area instead of the other, um, which distorts what people would naturally research on. In, in. Um, but th the studies tend to show that if anything, it impedes innovation. Um, so I just sent a link to the chat and you can go through just a summary of all the studies I found and none of them could show conclusively. The only studies trotted out by the pro IP crowd that they claim prove it are just bogus, bogus correlations. Like they'll have a, a US Commerce Department study which just basically assigns to, to every business in the country a classification of whether they're IP intensive or not. In other words, whether you're high tech or not. And so they'll say, well, what's the US economy, like $17 trillion GDP or something like that? They'll say, well, uh, one third of the US economy is IP dependent because they have technology. And therefore, intellectual property contributes $5 trillion a year to the economy. This is the kind of arguments you get, which is completely um, fallacious, of course. And then my favorite argument is when they measure innovation with patents in order to prove that patents uh, produce, produce innovation. Yeah, actually, uh, one of the Austrian sympathetic um, researchers, his name is Pierre Disrochers. He's in Canada. Um, about 15, 18 years ago, he wrote an article. I think it was for the Review of Austrian Economics. It's on my website, c4sif.org. It's called uh, On the Use of Patents as um, Economic Indicators or something like that. This is done all the time. Uh, you know, some people will bemoan China. They'll say China is um, overtaking American innovation because they're filing even more patents now. At the same time, they'll criticize China for not respecting IP and for stealing American IP. I mean, which one is it? Do they have a lot of patents and they really respect IP or they don't? You know, it's just all over the map. But um, yeah, of course, I mean, I've prosecuted in my career, I don't know over a thousand patents for different companies. And my experience is that companies will keep an important invention secret as a trade secret if they can. If it's the type of invention that you can't help but reveal its, its, um, its design when you sell the product, you know, it's going like if you have a new mousetrap, you can't hide the features that are new in fact, you're going to promote those features on the advertising to try to sell it. So that's going to tell your competitors how to make an improved mousetrap to compete with you. So you can't keep that as a trade secret. So you might as well get a patent on it. So patents tend to get filed only on things that would be revealed anyway publicly. And, and the, the, the alleged purpose of the patent system is to encourage disclosure of inventions that would be kept secret otherwise. That's why you get a reward. The patent reward is in reward for your disclosing to the public. That's why you have to have a written disclosure. But it doesn't even do that. You're basically giving out monopolies for free because people would already have to disclose their invention just by selling the product. Yeah. And I think uh, an, another, another example of the um, uh, studies that they use are just theoretical modeling where you know they do a bunch of math equations that uh, have no link to real world data and real world examples and illustrate with the model how if you uh, have patents then you get more and this is this is what i like to call economic sock puppetry uh, you just you know you build the model to give you the results that you want and then you conclude that see i've proven what i wanted to prove but i think yeah i think uh, the way that i like to think about it is 
uh, you know, Isaac Newton's famous words, um, if I could see further, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Um, patents are effectively attacks on the shoulders of giants. It makes standing on other people's shoulders much harder, and therefore it makes things, it makes it much harder for the Newtons to see what's going on. And interestingly enough, you know, when you look at the history of science and technology, and you look at the history of um, music and art, um, you know, Beethoven didn't need a patent uh, or copyright in order to uh, come up with their uh, song, with his uh, symphonies. Uh, the best uh, art um, was, it did not require patents and um, copyrights. And in fact, when you look at the world today, I think you could say that um, the fact that you grant these monopolies to people uh, is probably correlated to the fact that things keep getting crappier because um, all you need to do is get a patent on something and then get a patent on uh, get a um, get a, get the way to, to distribute it to others and you don't need to innovate as much. You know, if you have the right lawyers, you don't really need to innovate all that much and. Frankly, when I think about it, um, you know, when you think about many of the companies that uh, exist today, um, I, I wonder, for instance, I haven't studied Microsoft extensively, but I wonder just how much Bill Gates and the Microsoft people have actually produced useful things rather than just um, took useful things from others. And uh, what they've added is the lawyers and the patents and the ability to um, the ability to basically sue anybody who copies them and to uh, cause trouble and then just end up becoming the major player in the in industry. When you think about it, um, Windows has been a quasi-monopoly almost for 20, 30 years now. And that's largely because of patents and copyrights and uh, all these laws. I don't think it's, uh, it's something that's merited on the market. I think if we had a free market, um, we'd have a lot more open source software and we'd have a lot more uh, richer ecosystem of computing all over the world. We'd have, I think instead of having uh, Microsoft as the dominant uh, operating system, we probably have something like 10 apples where uh, we have different kinds of arrangements in terms of uh, software and hardware bundling. So some people specialize in software, some people specialize in hardware and some people combine the two. And I think uh, uh, in a free market, uh, you know, you wouldn't get as much, um, you wouldn't get as many Bill Gates becoming so rich, but I think you'd have better software for users. Uh, this is, this is my uh, intention, my, um, my intuition toward how these things affect it. I, th I think IP is a major force for centralization of uh, production into quasi monopolies. And when you, when you read the, uh, economics textbooks, you know, the economics textbooks always scaring you of market monopolies that require government intervention. And they bring up examples like Microsoft and they fail to bring up the fact that the reason that they have this monopoly in the first place is because of patent law. So we don't need to use antitrust in order to bring Microsoft down. We just need to stop um, indulging them and all of those uh, armies of lawyers and, and giving them ownership over other people's property, you know, other people's computers and other people's uh, hardware and software. Um, yeah, so um, Theo has a question in the chat. How do the pro IP people explain that people bother to invent stuff before the existence of IP protection? <laughs> it's an excellent one. Um, any I mean, they, they don't have a good argument. They just ignore it or they just change the subject or, the, or they'll say, well, there wasn't much innovation before or they'll say that, well, um, that was back when the kings would have to give you a um, to be a patron or something like that. And we don't want to go back to those days, do we? Even, even while we have Patreon now and we have private awards like SpaceX and we have government awards in the form of NI, NI, NIS grants or, you know, all these things, um, uh, military, <laughs> military research grants. So we have an award system now in addition to the monopoly system. Um, so they just don't have a good, they don't have a good response to that. I think what they say is basically, well, there would be some innovation, but it's not optimal. So they make that argument sort of like the antitrust argument where they have all these charts and they try to show that, 
there's a reduction in production of um, consumer goods or an increase in, 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 in price, uh, a suboptimal production of goods for consumers if you, if you allow monopolies to exist. <laughs> and ironically, at the same time, they favor the granting of monopolies in the form of patents to prevent another suboptimality. So to these guys, they always want to optimize things and they want to trust the government to optimize it, even though it's not in the government's interest. And even though the real reason it's suboptimal is because of government intervention in the first place, it's, it's all schizophrenic and, and nonsense. Yeah, and I think another, another way in which they try and uh, justify it is that... Uh, well, you know, back in the dark ages and in the ancient times, we didn't have a lot of innovation, but now we live in a world with a lot of advanced technologies and they kind of try and claim the, uh, they, they claim the credit for that. So the reason that we had incredible things in the 20th centuries and we had all those nice toys is because we developed patents. But I think it's the other way around. In fact, if you look at the, um, if you look at the development of the steam engine, it's, it seems pretty clear that uh, James Watt having a patent had allowed him to slow down the development of engines all over England when people were copying him. And arguably, uh, things would have advanced faster if we weren't, uh, uh, if, if we didn't have these patents. Yeah, there's another example. Um, um, because of the Wright brothers' patents on the airplanes in the US, um, uh, they stifled the whole industry. So leading up to World War One, the, the industry moved to France or something like that. So like the U.S. and other countries had to go outside the U.S. to buy airplanes because we just had killed the whole industry with the patent wars about it here. Um, it was finally settled. It's, the whole case is just amazing. But um, but did you want to talk about how OCA came about, too, which was Jed's Jed's brainstorm? And yeah. his idea? Yes, Absolutely. It's a good time so to transition. Apply, let's let's... Want to apply all of this to the Bitcoin space, and Jed has been working on that. So please, go yeah, ahead, Jed. yeah, and let's not forget that those companies, the steam engine, the airplane, these were technology companies of the day. I mean, we don't think of them as tech companies today, but back then they were tech companies. Uh, but yeah, in the blockchain space, to put this in context, if you look at the patent filings in the blockchain space, there were a few hundred per year in in 2016, 17, 18. Uh, but last year and 2019 saw each year over 10,000 patent filings. Um, so there is a, a wave of patents coming in the blockchain space. And when you look at these patents, a lot of them are being filed by a small number of, of uh, protagonists, antagonists, actors. And um, they intend to use them, obviously, some to protect their, their core business, like I believe a lot of the patents filed by IBM are around protecting their hyperledger ecosystem, but others intend to use them in a predatory manner, I believe, to, to hunt down successful crypto and blockchain companies and basically shake them down and, and take their market once they've proven that they're viable. The other thing is, is looking at these patents, a lot of them are weak. They're in a phase now where they're filed. They're not necessarily all granted. Um, and they're based on existing open source technology, so patent piracy, if you will. They're taking technology that's, that's already out there and simply being the first to patent it. Um, and the purpose of OCA is complementary to other patent alliances out there. You have Lot Network, which is a patent um, pooling sort of anti-patent troll organization. So you put your patents in, and then if your patent goes into a, a patent troll, uh, all the other Lot members get a get a royalty-free license to, to be protected um, with that patent. Um, and then you have COPA, which is an organization where people agree not to sue each other over patents among members. Uh, but OCA is different. The purpose of Open Crypto Alliance is actually to identify those weak patents that are there now in the filing process, ideally, and then to challenge them directly and, and to annul them effectively and turn them in, into void patents and keep that technology in the public domain, prove the prior art, and, and make sure that everybody has freedom to operate in the blockchain space. So, and how I got into this is I've been thinking about patents in blockchains for, for quite a while. Um, and I actually filed a patent on a technology called PeerChain in 2017 as part of a defensive strategy. So the idea there was to, to patent that so that when someone came along and said they had a patent that I was infringing, I could have a patent that shows I'm, I'm within my own patent and not infringing theirs. Also joined Lot Network back then, by the way. 
Um, and then OCA is just the next iteration in this is drive to keep crypto open and free. So that's yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so, so what, 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 tell us more about what you do at the, OCA is the Open Crypto Alliance. And so the that's plan correct. is. Yeah. And we're, we're pretty new. I mean, we just set it up in the last couple months. It started at the end of last year. And now we're looking for support. We were raising funds and those funds will be used to oppose patents that are in the pipeline. Uh, particularly those that are being amassed by, by actors who we believe intend to use the patents to control or stifle innovation in the space. Um, so, the, and the, a lot of those patents are the easiest ones to go after as well, because like I said, they're based on existing prior art open source technologies. So the, the point is to do that. Ideally, we'd like to crowdsource among supporters and members, a lot of the research for prior art. So patent <coughs> offices today, are, are overloaded patent um, inspectors don't see the full picture. And uh, we believe that the community has a much better overview of, of what's happening on, on GitHub and, and elsewhere. And so we can crowdsource prior art in order to build the cases and selectively choose those patents that are gonna be maximum benefit to have in the open um, public domain and oppose those ones with priority. So that is, that's the plan. I see. And of course this is, uh, you know, Patent trolls. Uh, for for people who are not very familiar, could you give us a little bit of a, a little bit more color about this breed of troll? Uh, what do they do and how they? Uh, how, a how patent they... assertion entity, as the lawyers insist, I call them, are um, are that's a patent troll or a patent pirate. So it's a company whose whose objective is to. Uh, make money by shaking down other companies using a portfolio of patents that they've acquired through one way or the other. Um, and uh, I think the official definition is if an entity makes more than 50% of its revenue in that manner, it is a patent assertion entity. Um, and, and there are some entities out there, one uh, that's operated by someone claiming to be Satoshi or he's one of the founders of, which has amassed uh, well over a thousand uh, patent applications and and has clearly stated that the intent is to control the industry uh, by using these patents in, a, in an aggressive and combative manner. And let me yeah. let me just add one thing here too. Um, patent trolls are not the only problem and um, um, so a patent troll is just someone who doesn't basically own the technology that they have a patent on and they sue other people who the patent covers. And that's considered to be like an unfair fight. It's like if you have two guys fight each other in a boxing ring, it's a fair fight because they both have gloves. But – and in normally in the, in the world before the patent troll phenomena, if you have two companies, they tend to both – that are competitors. They tend to both have patents on their parts, and if, if one guy sues the other, the other guy can use his own patents and counter sue the other guy. So it's sort of like a fair fight. So they might back down or settle. This is what happened in the, in the smartphone wars, right? Apple, and so that it actually helps to create cartels and, and oligopolies. But anyway, it's considered to be a fair fight. Um, but with a troll, you can't counter sue them because they're not practicing what you might be doing because they're not a competitor. Now, in the Bitcoin space, I'm not 100% sure whether all the potential patent threats are from trolls or they're from competitors. In a sense, the threats from competitors are even worse because a patent troll just wants a little bit of money from you. They want to wet their beak like the mafia, and they don't want to take too much because they want to kill you because they want to keep coming back to – you know they don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. So they're like a little tax, um, but the guys that have patents that cover their own products, they view the other Bitcoin players as competitors, and they might use their patents not to ask you for a license. But to shut you down, right, or to steer the industry in a certain way according to their vision of how Bitcoin or crypto should be. So, in a sense, the the threat wielded by patents held by non trolls is even greater than the threat from patent trolls. But from our point of view, I don't think it matters. Basically, we're going to identify patents that are threats to the crypto ecosystem, and try to identify the ones that are most ripe for attacking based on. Prior art and whether and the and the phase that they're in, in in the patent application process. Um, would you say that's fair, Jed? Absolutely, yeah, that's absolutely. 
Yeah, I think uh, as a little side note, I think um, th this is a great example of uh, just how how stifling uh, patents can be for innovation. Because if you look at the example of cell phones or you look at the example of pharmaceuticals, um, you know, let's say you were uh, messing around in your laboratory and you came up with a concoction that can in fact cure COVID or can cure cancer or can cure some uh, disease. And you, you know, you, you try it out on somebody, you know, who's sick and it works and you try it on more people and it keeps working uh, because of patents it's practically impossible for you to make uh, good money from it. And it's practically impossible for you to take it to market. If you wanted to do that, in order for it to go to market, you need to get the, you know, you need to get FDA approval and you need to get all of these, um, and, and, you, and you need to get it uh, patented. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And that's something that you don't have if you are just an innovator, a, a chemist who's making those things. But it is something that large pharmaceutical companies have because they have armies of lawyers. And so what ends up happening with drugs is that the people that are experimenting with the drugs, the people that are actually devising the concoctions end up getting paid very, very, very little. And uh, it costs something like $10 billion to get a drug out on the market in about 10 years. And this is outdated statistics. I remember reading this in... Uh, Mikhail Boldrin's book um, against intellectual monopoly. So it's, it, it might be much higher right now. It's, it's, it's practically, you know, nobody or very few people have a billion dollars in 10 years to go and get a drug approved, a billion, it's not 10 billion, but very few people have a billion dollars in 10 years to get a drug approved. But the people who do have it are um, the uh, pharmaceutical companies. And so they're able to take that concoction from the, uh, you know, the postdoc in a lab somewhere who's working on it and pay them a few hundred thousand dollars and then spend the 10 years and running through the hoops of the um, uh, process in order to get it approved and patented, and then they'll sell it. And so if you think about it, compared to a world in which there was no uh, patent, well, then in that world, you know, the market would be the one that would judge if your drug was good. And so you come up with a drug, you start bottling it and selling it to people and people take it and they get cured and they tell their friends and their friends take it. And then the thing spreads and you make money on it before anybody has time to copy you. And that's it. And the drug is out of there on the market. Because of the patent process, we end up getting stuck in this uh, war of litigation that, you know, we'll have 10 years of people dying because they can't access this drug while the inventor of the drug can't make money from it and while the pharmaceutical companies and their lawyers are uh, fighting it out and the lawyers obviously as always um, you know that they, they make they're the ones who end up making the money so if you think about this in the uh, bitcoin space i think this is this this is what can be worrying because if you're if you're a company in the bitcoin space and you're working on something that's innovative um, you know, unless you've got yourself an army of lawyers, it is likely that somebody with an army of lawyers, with a bigger army of lawyers than yours, might be able to take your idea, call it theirs, and then um, essentially patent it and um, take it away from you even. Now, to give an example, um, suppose you made a, a lightning network payment system where you had, you know, price tags in retail shops and an app, and this got wide adoption and you're a startup doing this. So you take a small fee on these transactions, which is cheaper than Visa or MasterCard. So merchants love you, you know, consumers love you. You're doing well, you get to a million a year in turnover and you think you've got a nice little crypto business running here. And that's the moment when, when one of these trolls will come and, and assert and shake you down. And you may have a million a year in revenue, but it's going to be very hard for you to, to cough up a quarter million dollars or maybe more to deal with that shakedown, whether you take it to court or just settle. So you're effectively out of business as soon as you begin to get traction. And that's the scenario that Open Crypto Alliance is here to prevent. That's, that's our core mission. You know, by invalidating those patents that people would use to attack that, that small business that's getting traction. Nobody wants to attack a crypto company that doesn't have traction. There's no money in it. Exactly. Or, 
or let me emphasize something else too. Um, you know, there's as Bastiat and Hazlitt talk about, there's the seen and the unseen. So it's not just these companies that start up and then they fail because of the threat. You know, there are companies that never come into existence in the first place because if you're a high tech startup or some kind of technology startup and there's a patent minefield out there, you know, your investors know this. And so it's harder to raise funds because you have to prove to them, number one, I'm not going to get sued out of existence by a patent. And how can you prove that? Because there's so many patents and the law is so vague. And you have to prove to them that you're proactively acquiring your own patents because these investors think that it's, an, it's, it's a defensive arsenal that you need to have, which is either true or not true in some cases. But the point is that's expensive. So you have a startup who's struggling to raise funds. They don't have a big revenue stream yet, if any, and they're trying to persuade people to give them money, and that's hard enough to do. And they have to raise another million dollars just to have money there to hire people like me to go get patents because they have to play the game. So all this has a huge drag on the the whole you know entre- space of entrepreneurship and startups in general. It's it's just impossible to know how many companies never started because of the the heavy cost. I mean, you have to go buy insurance to insure yourself against possible suits, and the insurance is extremely expensive for patent litigation insurance. Um, and if you don't have it, some investors are afraid to invest. So money flows into the established you know, legacy industries. So um... – What's um, what's there to um, guarantee that the Open Crypto Alliance won't itself turn into a uh, <laughs> a mechanism for shaking down uh, Bitcoin companies? If you'll excuse the rude question, but I mean, couldn't you just? Uh, How would uh, we do that? We, we're not going to hold any patents. Our our idea is to get rid of patents. Okay, so that's the focus is not to get patents for anybody, but to just. No. Stop people from getting patents on ideas. Right. Yeah, maybe the focus we should... is to go after other parties that are applying for patents that we believe are abusive or will become abused uh, in the future that, that are going to lock down innovation in, in the crypto and blockchain space. So the Alliance will not hold any patents. We don't do anything with our members' patents. Um, it is simply a proactive effort to stop patents from being granted. Obviously, we, we probably won't chase our own members' patent applications. So there's a good reason to become a donor and a member, but um, we are not going to hold patents and we're not going to shake down any, any crypto companies. Well, that's reassuring. Um, Maybe so- – uh, hold on a second. Maybe, Jed, you can explain the difference between the lot network and those other models and ours sure. because some of those uh, – some people don't understand the whole patent – practicality and and how our what we're doing is different and we're not a threat at all it is yeah lot so lot network it's all one word if you look up their website lot lot stands for license on transfer and this is a network which all the big tech companies google's one of the founders they're all involved in a lot Mm -hmm. of companies and the way it works is you join that network and then your patents become part of the lot network And that means that if your patent falls into the hands of a patent assertion entity or patent troll, um, meaning a company that makes its living by uh, shaking down other companies based on their patents, then if you're sued based on that patent, you have a license because it was in the network, the the license on transfer. So when, if, if for example, KYC3 has a patent, we're a member of Lot Network, I go bankrupt for whatever reason, and my patent gets bought by a patent troll in that bankruptcy proceeding, that's a transfer. The minute that transfer happens, if the acquirer is a patent troll, everyone in the lot network has a license to use my patent and therefore can't be sued using that patent. So that's what lot network does. COPA is more of a coalition um, and it's a crypto open patent network. And, and it is a coalition where the members of COPA who all have patents agree not to use their patents to sue each other. So they all are holding patents, but if you and I are both COPA members, we're not gonna sue each other because we've signed paperwork saying that's, that's not gonna happen. 
And then Open Crypto Alliance is a third kind of beast. What we're here to do is simply oppose patents that are being applied for so that those patents never get granted and that the technology behind them remains in the public domain based on prior art or, or other uh, factors that we can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, one, one other uh, particular uh, um, uh, horse I like to keep whipping when it comes to patents in pharmaceuticals is the fact that um, you cannot patent anything that exists in nature. It has to be a novel compound that you have uh, created. And so therefore, this means that all of modern medicine is entirely geared away from natural existing compounds, regardless of yep. their effectiveness, because there's no money to be made in uh, treating people with things that exist out there in nature that are not, uh, that can't be patented. Whereas if you come up with a chemical substance that is new, and, you know, in, in many cases, what pharmaceutical companies are trying to do is they take the active and effective ingredient in a natural cure and then try and change it into something that is artificial, that is unique, that is distinct enough that it is no longer uh, naturally occurring in nature and then get a patent to it. And so there's this insane bias to try all these um, chemicals that are concocted in a lab and never try anything that is natural because you can't get a patent on things that are natural. And so uh, th th this is really why, um, uh, you know, natural compounds are not very popular for treatment, even though treatments are usually derived from them. So a lot of medicines come from uh, these things. Don't get me started on, on not finding a cure and rather finding a treatment to symptoms. And that is an even more twisted element in the pharmaceutical industry. Absolutely, because the cure will rather you know, sell a pill a month. Exactly. If somebody takes the market a pill and cured, there's no money to be made there. But if you are able to just manage their symptoms, exactly. then that's a lifelong relationship that you've got there. And I, I, I remember somebody told me, it's just uh, somebody once told me and it really stuck with me, said uh, the, the, the um, patent system is geared toward not finding cures. It can't function with cures. If you pay a billion dollars in 10 years in order to get something out of the market, you can't have that thing actually work because if it works, there's no way you're going to make the money out of it. Um, whereas if you, have, if, you, if you build the dependency relationship with the customer, that's what works. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's probably true of uh, most pharmaceutical drugs. They're optimized for dependency and long-term uh, commitment rather than uh, effectiveness, which in a free market, you wouldn't get, you know, in a free market, you wouldn't have to wait 10 years and pay a billion dollars to get it out. And so then it would be pretty straightforward to get it done. Um, all right, but let's, uh, let's not uh, get too much into pharmaceuticals get back to bitcoin how does how is this different in the case of bitcoin when it comes to uh, or in case of uh, immutable blockchains the fact that anybody can put uh, something on a blockchain and then uh, everybody who has that blockchain running on their nodes which is primarily a problem for bitcoin because it's the only one that has uh, a lot of distributed nodes uh, then everybody who wants to run the Bitcoin um, blockchain is basically uh, doing copyright infringement. So how, how, how can that be weaponized as an attack vector against Bitcoin so that anybody who's running a Bitcoin node is in contravention of copyright law and then you know, you go to jail for running a Bitcoin node because your Bitcoin node has uh, copyright material? What do you think? I, I think the key uh, that, that wrote the, the transaction to put the copyrighted material in the chain would be the one infringing the copyright, not the hosts. It's just the way uh, telecoms operators are not held liable for the content of their wires, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I rather view a blockchain network as, as a network the way a satellite uh, or telecoms distribution network would work. And the content that goes over that network uh, is the responsibility of the originator of that content. I mean, copyright law is one thing, but, but think about child pornography. What if someone wrote a JPEG of child pornography into the Bitcoin chain? Uh, does that make every host a, a child pornographer? No, it's, it's the, the, the key, the 
signed that transaction is the guilty party, in, in my opinion. Stefan, you may have a different opinion on that. I'm not sure if the law settled on that. that that's a good argument, I think, uh, which is one reason we should all oppose the efforts in the U.S. at least and probably similar efforts in Europe and elsewhere um, to get rid of the, the Section 230 safe harbor in the Communications Decency Act and the similar um, safe harbor in the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, for copyright, So, which basically treats – platforms or ISPs as not being liable for copyright infringing or defamation or other type of content by their users because they're just platforms, um, which would be the argument Jed's trying to make. That would So you would analogize the Bitcoin system as a platform, and what people put into it is they're like the users, and you know the, a particular user may be guilty of copyright infringement for putting – or for child porn or whatever, but the platform is not. But that's one reason we should oppose. You know, there's a lot of hate right now in the conservative and libertarian community toward the tech giants like Google and Facebook and um, app, um, uh, Twitter, and they're wanting to get rid of their Section 230 exemption, which which just means that they will be liable for defamation lawsuits for content posted by their users. That's all it means, or for copyright infringement for. Co copyright infringing content by their users. But since copyright and defamation law are totally totally uh, unlibertarian and unjust, we should not want to remove these safe harbors because we shouldn't want to impose this liability on these companies, even if you don't like these companies, because you know it wouldn't stop with them. It, it would it would affect Bitcoin, for example, and us. Um, so I, I tend to I think I agree with you, Jed. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, you know, uh, most of the code and the, uh, you know, the white papers and um, all of the things that uh, uh, that are used to make Bitcoin work, all of that stuff is out there in the uh, public domain, de facto, at least. It's all um, it's all publicly accessible. And yet we witness some attempts by people to try and claim ownership of that. And so, you know, we, we see so there's a character who's uh, suing uh, websites like Bitcoin.org for posting the uh, Bitcoin white paper because they claim that it is actually their uh, work. Um, I'm wondering how much of a case can somebody like that get? Um, and what's the worst damage that they can do to others? So is it just about dragging people to court? And um, I mean, I... I presumably think that they can't really damage Bitcoin itself. Um, they can damage individual Bitcoiners or individual webmasters for posting things um, by dragging them to court and so on. So I'm wondering, what do you think are the uh, possibilities there? Um, well, I suppose they could, uh, you could go after the exchanges, which could cause a a trouble at first, but the exchanges can move around. Um, you know, it's just like an attack by the government. If the if the government decided to start shutting down exchanges, would that kill Bitcoin? I think probably not. Um, but the person suing for copyright infringement would have to prove that they own the copyright, which means they have to prove they're the author, which means they have to prove they're Satoshi. Um, and I doubt there's anyone out there uh, at, at at the present time who can credibly prove that in court. Um, so I think they would probably lose in court, but whether someone who's being targeted could could mount legal defense, could afford to do that is another question. Um, the problem – at least in the US, there are statutory damages which are up to $150,000 per infringing act, and I don't know, even know what that means on the internet. Does that mean if you upload a paper or if you copy it that if other people copy it, it's multiplied by 1,000? So damages can be astronomical. It's, it's totally um, unrealistic, but that's the law that we have. I think uh, one law professor about 10 years ago did an estimate that every American citizen is potentially liable for like $3 billion of damages every year from just mundane everyday activities of forwarding emails and copying and pasting things, just doing a couple of things that are copyright infringement. 
like say, so several billion dollars per person. And if you multiply that times the number of people, there's not enough wealth in the galaxy for that. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, the, the end point of the patent economy is that everybody's starving and suing each other. And <laughs> we do nothing but sue each other. I think this is uh, this is where uh, where we seem to be heading, unless you know Bitcoin comes and uh, fixes all of this and saves us, hopefully. Uh, Daniel, you had a question. Yes. Um, yeah, I was just thinking whilst you guys were talking about like patents and and, and things and um, this 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 NFT that the non fungible tokens that that are cropping up and being talked about I, I can't really understand uh the need for them but maybe uh jed or, or stefan um you could talk a little bit more about it but the way i understand it people that want to protect whether it's artwork or even a, a product um to put that pattern as a non-fungible token on the the bitcoin blockchain so if anybody ever copies it in the future they can say hey that was my work and here it is in the blockchain with this address um yeah, Jed, Je, you seem to be nodding your head. Sure. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll fire yeah, that um, one at you. Um, NFTs are are um, a token that represents a unique token, but the purpose of an NFT is not to assert copyright or, or patent or anything like that. The, the NFT is actually a bearer asset, just like Bitcoin, but being non fungible, the bearer has a unique object, a unique digital object in their possession. NFTs have uh, on-chain and off-chain metadata. So what you would do if you want to attach an NFT to an artwork, for example, if it's a digital artwork, you can hash that artwork, the JPEG file, and you put the hash of that JPEG file in the NFT on the chain. So whoever has that NFT then is declared to own the copyright on that JPEG. So the NFT is just a mechanism that allows you to tie an off-chain object to a token that can be transferred from person to person uh, on chain with a record of it. The, the off chain metadata can be much more exhaustive for an NFT so that, and it can also be dynamic. So using this, you can actually have a bearer asset that has different functions based on, on who is, is holding it and can refer to different things. So, also, if you look at, um, like you could issue an NFT to represent ownership in a, in a piece of real estate. So you can think of NFT, uh, an NFT kind of like a deed. It refers to something else um, and whoever has that piece of paper or digital NFT in their possession is the one who can assert, I am the controller of that off-chain element that this NFT refers to. So in terms of, I'm, I'm sure there are patents filed on NFT technology that are pending, uh, that's for sure, in different ways of using it, because there are use cases for NFTs that have not been uh, explored yet um, that, are, that are very, very new. CryptoKitties was the first kind of big one, but that's just a you know, hashing of a thing and referring to it, as I, as I explained. Uh, but there will be other uses. NFTs can also be used as like um, a membership card, for example, a digital membership card to show that you're a member of a club, but uniquely you are member number 73 or whatever it is, or you have these attributes. So there are lots of uses for NFTs, but they're that reference. It's not actually a, a copyright. When people talk about putting a copyright of a song on chain, what they actually mean is creating a hash of the song or a, or, or a record of the song and then referring to that in a token that then represents ownership of that. Uh, an interesting project that, that really explored this legally, and, and unfortunately the project was not a success, um, was called Mecenas. And what they did is they wanted to create a, a way to own real world art. They actually did an auction for a, an Andy Warhol piece uh, on chain, but in a way that didn't require KYC and facilitated fractional ownership with fungible tokens like Bitcoin. So you could own you know, a millionth of, of that Andy Warhol painting. And they did that by, by legally setting up a structure where they created one NFT, which was then held in a smart contract that behaved like a trust. And then that smart contract issued ERC-20 fungible tokens that each represented a share of ownership of that NFT. 
So it sounds convoluted, but at the end of the day, they were able to represent a physical artwork as a non-fungible token that was then irrevocably given to a smart contract on chain, which then issued shares in that artwork that weren't shares legally because they were digital partial ownership of an NFT. So a very interesting project. They spent a lot of money on lawyers. Might be one of the reasons they didn't succeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a surefire way of um, guaranteeing uh, failure and success for your lawyers. Uh, well, maybe that's not fair. You kind of do need lawyers to succeed. But, you know, I'm an economist and we hate lawyers and it's mutual. Um, Stefan is the only good one. Jed, are you a lawyer too? <laughs> no, I'm a technologist. Okay. I'm, I'm 35 yeah. years in tech, cypherpunk from back in the 90s, mix master. You know, non pen at phi, if anyone's old enough to remember those things. So Stefan still remains the only undefeated uh, lawyer in, in, in the entire uh, profession. So what kind of, what kind of things should individuals um, be worried about? So crypto alliances for companies, as an individual user, is there anything you need to be worried about with that regard? Because there was... There was a, there was a um, uh, Stefan mentioned there was a, there was an, uh, a Bitcoin character on Twitter who's getting sued right now because he has spent a, quite a bit of time going online telling the world that uh, somebody claiming to be Satoshi is not Satoshi. Um, so uh, other than that, do you see any kind of uh, serious threats for individuals? We went over the running a node and we think uh, that's probably not a problem, but other than that, what kind of uh, issues might happen in the Bitcoin blockchain space that might, uh, uh, you know, that uh, the average individual should be careful about not to get into trouble and get dragged into court? I'll leave that for you, Stefan. Uh, I was going to leave it for you, Jed. <laughs> Well, Let's from see. my standpoint, yeah. I, don't, I don't see issues as an individual, you know, running a node and as a user, patents uh, are not going to affect you, copyright, my libel and, and defamation laws potentially on Twitter, but I don't see a, a big patent risk for an individual. It's the minute you start writing code that patent law might affect you. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for individual coders and individual contributors to Bitcoin Core, what should they uh, keep in mind when they're doing this stuff? Keep in mind that they're writing code that someone may try to assert a patent against. And if they're the contributor of that code, I, I don't know uh, the details of how that would play out. Stefan, you probably know better than I do, but... Um, well, so the way, you know, the, you know for our OC... A name potentially. In a, in a patent suit. Yeah, so our in, um, in the OCA, we're, we're trying to identify patents that are invalid, and what that means is that the patent should not have been granted or should not be granted. Um, and what that means is it doesn't satisfy some of the requirements that patents need to satisfy to be granted, which would be novelty. It means it has to be brand new. No one did exactly the same thing before. Um, or non-obviousness, that's probably the main thing we'll go after. Like um, it's something that was already known or, or that enough was already known that the, the thing you're claiming a patent on is obvious in view of that. Uh, or in Europe, it's called inventive step. There's no inventive step. Um, but there's other grounds, and one would be that the person claiming the patent is simply not the inventor because you have to be the inventor to get a patent. Which means that if you learn about an idea from someone else and you claim it as a patent, it's not just that there's prior art out there because of the previous invention. It's that you're not the inventor. Someone else is the inventor. So if you can, if you can prove that this person learned of it from someone else, then they're actually committing a fraud on the patent office, and they're in big trouble, and their lawyers are too. Um, in my mind, that rarely happens to be honest. Uh, you know. So one thing you can do if you're a, a code developer… I think most of these guys are putting their stuff in the in the commons anyway through um, the CC. I don't know what the licenses they use is it MIT or something. It was one of these uh, open source type licenses, right, Jed? Yeah, MIT or Apache are the most common. Yeah, which means that, and plus the code is made public, I assume. So instead of filing a patent for defensive reasons, you can simply publish your ideas, 
and that serves as for two re- that serves two purposes. Number one, it starts a prior art click talk clock ticking. Um, in other words, if someone else later files a patent on that, even if they invented it themselves, they reinvented it themselves, they would be barred from getting a patent because there's prior art out there that predates their filing. Okay. So it's just like a pat- – so a patent can be invalidated by any publication. It doesn't have to be another patent. It could be just an article or a blog post or a product that's sold with, with certain features being made public. So one thing they can do is make sure they publicize their code and their ideas on some public forum, uh, which you can prove later right? as soon as possible. And the other purpose it serves is it proves who the inventor is. Um, or it proves who the inventor is not, rather. So if someone else just copies this idea and puts it in a patent a year later, um, not only is it barred by prior art, but it, that would be a proof that this person wasn't the inventor and that they actually are just lying about being the inventor. So that'd be another grounds for attacking their patent. Yeah. What about solutions, Stefan? Like the the Benelux IP office has a thing called the IP box. You can actually upload your documents into their secure storage and they keep it and they hash it and, and refer to it. Yeah. That gives you digital time stamped proof uh, that you originated those documents on a certain date, even though they're not public. Correct. Oh, they're not public. I wasn't aware of that. In yeah. the US, there's a similar thing. You can instead of filing a patent, you can just uh, you can submit something for a minor fee like $100 or $200, and, and you can just ask the patent office to publish it. I forgot what it's called. It's a, it's a pr- uh, like a defensive patent publication or something. Um, okay. And that, that is safe, but you don't need to do that form- formality. You can just do it yourself. It's just a matter of proving that it was there. Uh, this is why in the old days, companies like IBM used to have a technical journal. It was just a self-published journal. Because IBM, which is a huge patent troll and a patent asserter, but even they don't file a patent on everything their engineers come up with because even they have limited budgets. You know, They might file 5,000 patents a year, but they might have 15,000 submissions from their engineers. So the ones that they don't file a patent on, some of them they would just publish in their IBM technical journal. And they would do that so that it would serve as prior art to prevent competitors from getting a patent on the same thing later. Um, I think that's sort of fallen into disuse with the identity of the internet because it's so easy to just post something on your own blog or your own web page. But of course, you could edit that later so someone could – it's a little bit harder to show proof, which is why some people suggested using blockchain for that, right? Like put put some hash or something in the blockchain so that you can prove it. But it's easier just to use the government solutions if you want to do that too. Yeah, the BIPO is not public. It's $35 or 35 euros for five years. And then you have to renew it or they erase it. I see. Yeah, so uh, Stefan just shared in the chat uh, an article that he'd written a while ago called Do Business Without Intellectual Property. And I kind of uh, am sympathetic to this idea of just, um, you know, try and be productive rather than just uh, try and uh, rather than try and rely on being a troll and uh, in fact I'm glad you mentioned IBM because when you think about it you know they've got a gigantic uh, blockchain industry and it seems pretty clear that they don't really do anything there other than just try and get patents and see what's going to happen and I wonder just how much of their business model is just um, is just uh, <laughs> Uh, trying to find patents that work and stick rather than actually trying to innovate something useful because uh, it's um, when you, when you're that large, when you've got that much money, then you can get patents on all kinds of things and you can just wait until people make useful things with that patent and then um, pounce and sue and make revenue from it. So um, it's, it's, it's another, as I was mentioning with the case of Microsoft, it's another, it's another subtle regulatory um, uh, setting that ends up really helping and favoring large corporations at the expense of uh, small innovators and uh, people who are coming up with nice and new ideas. IBM makes over a billion dollars a year on on their patent portfolio on wow. asserting those. Yeah, right. How much- and and. 
yeah, they're they're trolls basically. Even though they're not fifty one percent probably of their revenue, they're they're essentially a troll. Oh, it's like like eight to ten percent, I think, is the number yeah. I've heard thrown around. What else do they make their revenue from? Like, what the hell does IBM actually do this day? I've been asking people this question for many years, and nobody has an answer. They used to make computers. We know that. They don't anymore. Now they do blockchain and they do artificial intelligence. And so they make a bunch of buzzwords, but um, how do they get paid? Where do they get their revenue from? Probably do ta uh, consulting for the government. So they're doing tax harvesting probably. <laughs> yeah. They have a massive consulting practice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, they, and, they, and they have a massive investment practice because what they do is they borrow. I mean, essentially interest rate arbitrage is the business model for uh, most large corporations these days. You borrow it zero one or two percent and then you invest in all manner of uh, smaller companies and uh, you know uh, hope to get a higher return i think yeah it's sad but like this you know i i think in a in, in a world that wasn't dominated by fiat and patents i think ibm would still be out there making decent computers and people would be buying it and it would be a normal decent uh, proper business rather than uh, patent trolls and uh, interest rate arbitrage. But what are we gonna do? That's the world we live in. <laughs> Anybody have uh, any more questions or thoughts they'd like to share? No. It was great to be here. Thank you, Saif. Uh, it's a good discussion. Thank you. Um, Thank I'm you. I'm available much. at opencryptoalliance.org or uh, KYC3. Feel, yeah, reach out anytime. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, thank you guys for joining and thank you for what you're doing. This is um, quite uh, useful, um, particularly. In, in, in the Bitcoin space and what's going on these days, it's uh, it's good to be informed of this ugly world out there uh, and to, and to take your own precautions. So be careful, everybody. Thanks, Safe. Cheers, Stefan. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.